Hello and welcome everyone. So this is part two of the lectures on sweatshops. And so now what I'm going to do is I'm going to focus on developing Matt Zawinski's arguments in favor of uh, or in favor of the idea that sweatshops are not as bad as people think. So the way that I usually like to present this is I like to say, well, the important thing here is to be able to analyze and evaluate the arguments using economic and ethical reasoning. So if you agree with Zelensky, why? And if you disagree with Zelensky, why? And the interesting thing then is like if we were having the regular class is we'd have a class discussion. We'd say, okay, well, what does Zelensky get right? What does Zelensky get wrong? And what are the relevant economic assumptions that we need to make if we're considering you know, labor markets or product markets that involve sweatshops? And what are the relevant assumptions Zelensky makes that are good and what are the assumptions that are that are bad from the model and then so on and so forth like how to what's what's different from your analysis and so that's like a really interesting way a really sort of valuable way to reflect on this exercise can't really do that in the context of sort of the virtual version here now but um, anyway so as you're going through as you're as you're looking through what I'm presenting from the standpoint of Zelensky's or my characterization of Zelensky's uh, perspective on these issues. Uh, think carefully. If you agree, why? If you disagree, why? And then, what are the relevant what What are the relevant economic aspects that are behind what what we're discussing? All right. So Zelensky's arguing. You know, maybe it's the case that sweatshops are not so bad after all. Um, he believes that sweatshops are good for the laborers themselves, and while observing that sweatshops very well might be exploitative. Arguably, this happens in a way that's mutually beneficial. So firms and consumers you know, benefit tremendously, but the argument is that, well, workers are gaining too. One of the themes and one of the things that came up in, the, in Zelensky's analysis of price gouging and then comes up again with sweatshops here is the belief that we've got a situation where sweatshops are operating where those workers are in dire circumstances. Their next best option, subsistence living, is not good. And so the idea is that, well, even though we find sweatshops abhorrent, the fact that people can choose to work in sweatshops and the fact that they do indicates that they're judging this as their next best alternative from arrangement of uh, from whatever the possibilities. Now, as I'm saying that, sort of a key aspect for that analysis and a key assumption from Zelensky's perspective here as well is that we're not thinking about a situation where there's coercion. We're going to call that something completely different where people are coerced into working in sweatshops. Now, then we come up with the 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 realization that somehow sometimes we find coercion is not necessarily being somebody is literally taking you and putting you in in the employ in the um, in the factory. But it's the case that you're sort of economically locked into whatever it is the case that you're doing. That's a separate discussion. That's something really interesting to reflect on. Um, and there's actually way more than we'll be able to cover here. But that's important to think about the degree to which somebody's economic alternatives themselves become coercive. Okay, so the observation is, well, workers are in a really, workers in this part, these parts of the world are, have a really desperate situation. And they have much more to gain from sweatshop labors than, or sweatshop labor from their employment in a sweatshop than does the employers themselves. One key observation is, well, the employer could go and operate in some other location, but these workers where they're presently located uh, don't have very good alternatives. And so arguably the, work, the wages that they're earning in the sweatshop are much higher than they could earn elsewhere. So what's happening is, well, the employers are gaining. Their gains are small because the employers could go elsewhere. So, all right, as we're saying this, we realize we we believe, like we come to believe through living in sort of um, life to this point that sweatshops are a pretty unpleasant, pretty abhorrent uh, sort of uh, feature of production. What Zelensky wants us to do is separate out the moral evaluation of the actions that the sweatshops are engaged in from the character of those operating the sweatshops. It's probably the case that those operating the sweatshops may not be the best of character. Who knows? Hard to hard to judge, hard to evaluate, but it might be that they're maybe that they're not of the best character. But even so, their actions are doing something that's making workers better off. Um, 
the observation and sort of the one of the sort of keys to Zelensky's view is, well, we're recognizing evidently if whatever was the labor package, so working conditions, wages, so on and so forth, if it wasn't better than what workers could get elsewhere, they simply wouldn't accept it. Now, if it's the case that they don't have a choice in accepting that package, now we're thinking about something very different, and then our conclusions and our and our analysis has to be different as well. Anyway, so Zelensky observes that a lot of people would like to shut down sweatshops. There's bans, there's boycotts, and Zelensky argues that this is a bad idea. So while sweatshops might be morally objectionable in themselves, while we don't really feel great about their existence, um, if even if we accept the assumption that sweatshops are morally objectionable, we still might not want to stop sweatshops from existing altogether. So here's the example that Zwinski likes to give. And after the example, I like to I like to pause class and ask, firstly, what do you think about the example? Is this an apt characterization um, for the sweatshop condition? What can we learn from the example? So on, so on and so forth. Are you convinced by it or not? Anyway, so, so kind of think about those things as we're going through this. So here's the example. You've got a person stranded in the desert. Somebody else comes along and offers to drive them home, but for $10,000. So Definitely, that's an unfair offer. Um, and so, you know, but the $10,000 would get the person out of the desert to safety. Suppose some third party could come along and could push a button to take away the unfair offer. Would we want them to do it? And so Zelensky says, well, maybe not, because the stranded person who's left stuck in the desert might then die of dehydration. So even though this is a super unfair offer, it is something that's going to ultimately make this person who's stranded, stuck in the desert better off. So then by analogy, well, we've got people in very dire circumstances. Somebody else comes in, opens up a factory and, and, and is running sort of this uh, sweatshop there. Would we want to remove that sweatshop from the equation? And Zwinski is arguing, well, maybe not, because the option of the admittedly sort of unfair option of the sweatshop um, the admittedly unfair option of the $10,000 to be driven to safety is still better than what happens in its absence. So I don't know. So think about the extent to which you're convinced by that. Uh, and there's some really interesting issues there again, right? So if you, if you don't, if you disagree or if you agree, like what are the relevant assumptions that are part of our analysis there? All right. So important reflection. Why don't we require minimum wages in the host countries overseas? So almost all sides of the debate agree we need uh, we do not need the same type of benefits overseas as in the United States um, for sort of a variety of reasons. Even so, we assume safety and benefits are normal economic goods. So with higher incomes, we buy more. Uh, in the U.S., we accept lower wages for safer conditions. If we offered sweatshop workers a trade trade off between wages and additional safety, it's not clear that they would or should. And so this is interesting. We can think about this in the context of intermediate micro. Think about a utility function where you've got two goods. One of the goods is going to be income. It's going to be money. And the other good is going to be like safety or something like this. And you could think of the marginal rate of substitution between safety and between wages. There's an interesting survey from one of Zwinski's co-authors, uh, Powell. So finding sweatshop workers' own preferences are for higher wages, even at the expense, uh, even at the expense of other benefits. And so now there's some really interesting things behind this, which is like maybe beyond a certain point is when you start buying back right safety with wages. So you think of uh, the standard sort of labor leisure trade off. There's two effects when your wages rise. So the first effect is as your wage rise rises, you might tend to want to work more because you're getting more greater returns for each hour worked. On the other hand, as your hourly wage rises, it becomes easier to hit some threshold level of living that you're trying to hit. And at a certain point, you'll work less because you'll want to be buying back literally your own time for leisure. So think about this. You can think about this for yourself. So, you know, so there's there's the argument for minimum wage of $15 an hour in the U.S., Suppose that was suppose that was your wage. Suppose it was thirty dollars an hour. Suppose it was fifty dollars an hour. Suppose hundred, two hundred dollars an hour. So as your so suppose that was actually your wage, right? At a certain point, you're going to want to work a lot because the 
huge returns for that time spent working. But beyond a certain point, you're going to want to work less because with the higher wage, you don't have to work as much to hit the same threshold as before. Anyway, so that could be something that's behind this evidence. But it's interesting, and there's other surveys besides just Powell's that are demonstrating that sweatshop workers are willing to accept you know, higher wages for, um, for worse conditions, given that maybe they, you know, at the, at the particular consumption bundle or bundle that we're choosing, these things are binding and there is actually a trade-off between the two. Now, that being said, from our standpoint, from my perspective here, I'd rather have the world where we'd have workers having better wages and better conditions. So, all right. So, interestingly, we could reflect on, suppose it was the situation where corporations came in um, and eliminated the other options so that only so that sweatshops were the only and best option available. So suppose the corporation came in, got rid of every other competing uh, competing industry in the labor market. So if you wanted a job, you had to work in the sweatshop. Um, so we wouldn't like that circumstance. The reflection is, well, truly and purely voluntary exchange respects individual autonomy. Um, neither party has to enter the exchange. So if they do, we assume that they're better off than uh, after the trade than they were before, even if it's their only option. Um, so sometimes governments can use coercion, maybe on behalf of corporations, to force people into these options. Um, in that case, the assumption of mutual benefit might not hold. Um, even so, it's not clear if we should ban collusive agreements between governments and corporations that might be doing something like this or not, simply because, well, if it's the case that if it's the case that there's no coercion, I suppose it would be the situation where you wouldn't necessarily want to ban those collusive agreements. Um, the worry would be, well, you'd be removing what was the next best alternative to those workers. All right, so another thing to reflect on, how are things changing over time? Do sweatshops keep host countries poor? So Zwinski argues, well, we've got this surprisingly common belief, but there's theoretical and empirical reasons to suggest it's actually not the case. So one thing that's interesting is thinking about the behavior of these multinational firms, right? They have this contractual relationship with some domestic firm, with some sweatshop, um, and then ends up having a situation where the workers are going to be trained to oversee the sweatshop. Um, and this generates some type of human capital for management that could be applied elsewhere in the economy. So the idea is, well, you've got this sweatshop that's being operated. There's got to be some management team. The management team are locals. Now those locals are receiving this experience that they wouldn't have had elsewhere. And so then when another company comes in, they're prime candidates for management and those things. And so goes the argument. I don't know. So maybe you're convinced, maybe you're unconvinced. Empirically, looking at where sweatshops have been over time, they tend not to stay in the same country for a long time, relatively speaking. So uh, around the late 90s, early 2000s, there was protests at U of A um, for, against Nike. So uh, Nike had began uh, in Japan with their first sweatshops, but by the 1980s, they'd moved to South Korea and then Taiwan. By the 1990s, to China and Indonesia. Um, what ended up happening in those areas? Well, workers got higher skill levels over time as a result of economic growth, uh, which gave them better opportunities um, to, to those workers who then had a lot better things to do than with their time than working in sweatshops. All right, so there's something interesting here. So um, we want to separate out causation from correlation. We don't necessarily want to take the strong view that this economic development is fully attributable to sweatshops. I think that is a little strong. Um, it could be the case that it's associated with greater economic development. Um, but either way, one important observation is that what ends up happening, well, as people's opportunities get better, then they no longer wish to work in sweatshops. I think that's really important for policy. So if we dislike sweatshops and I dislike sweatshops, we think about, well, what types of things can we do to be able to improve the options, improve the opportunities for workers in those regions? And so that's really some important questions to then answer. All right, so the last thing that Zwinski mentions is thinking about this sweatshop or sweat-free shop with a conscience uh, movement. And anecdotally, um, Powell plotted the list of the factories that were involved, which tended to be 
in North America in unionized shops um, where the workers were relatively speaking well compensated, at least compared to the workers that they're that the label was purporting to represent. So what's happening was the label was appealing to sentiments against sweatshops, basically to get you to buy from the developed world workers who are well off by global standards. So what's the problem? Now there's more money channeled away from the developing world and to those who by global standards are among the world's wealthiest. So Zwolinski concludes the claim that shopping with a conscience um, should look like this is really hard to defend. The thing actually, if you have a conscience, so says Zelensky, is you ought to buy from sweatshops because the more that we increase demand for the things that sweatshops are producing, the greater is the demand for workers themselves. Labor is a derived demand and ultimately means higher wages for people who need it very, very badly. All right, so that's sort of a characterization of Zelensky's view here. I think it's sort of interesting to sort of pause and reflect on each each aspect that I've now presented has actually kind of a lot to reflect on in terms of the extent to which we're convinced. Is it a fair characterization of the way that the world works or or not? What are the relevant assumptions? What are the relevant assumptions? Well, here, for instance, one argument is we'd say, okay, if we increase demand for products, that should increase demand for labor because labor is a drive demand. And the final assumption is that this increased demand for labor is going to mean higher wages. It may or may not be the case that that, act, that benefit actually gets passed on to workers, especially since we're talking about those in a really low bargaining situ situation, those with really low bargaining power. But anyway, so there's something to reflect on. And I think actually from the standpoint of developing your economic intuition, it's worthwhile looking back at the various uh, tenets of this view and thinking about, well, where's the aspects that the economic seems to fit? Where does it seem to not fit? And then what's your final analysis? So anyway, I hope you enjoyed the video. I'll see you next time.